function and later on in calculus four, three and four, you'll do vector calculus, which you don't need to travel across a straight line. So this is sort of baby steps to get to there. To vectors, yeah. So everything is one dimensional now. We're traveling on one dimensional, uh, like the I-5, going completely straight. Uh, <coughs> so we have a displacement function. Let's think about uh, s velocity, but or speed, but we'll think about average speed. So how do you figure out average speed if you know some positions at different times? How do we get average rate of change? So our function is position. So we'll find the average rate of change in our position. So we'll take two different times, find the positions. And we've seen this before. So normally we use the letter M. We could also call this delta S. For this, uh, this will be the change in S. Oh, actually, let's forget about the M for a second. We'll just go change in S. This will be S of T plus H minus S of T. And change in position, that looks like an A. Change in position divided by change in time, this will be the actual rate of change that we're used to. And of course the t minus t cancels in the denominator. So you could use this in your car if you were actually going perfectly straight and you knew your starting and ending locations and the time it took to get there. You could take your distance you travel divided by time. Or your odometer is another good one to look at. Your odometer counts your distance you traveled, although you don't need to go in a straight line. So that'll count the distance you travel. So you can compute your uh, average velocity or average speed on the way to uh, wherever you're going. Well, after you get there, you can compute it. So this will be average uh, rate of change. How do we find the instantaneous rate of change? So if you look at your speedometer, that will tell you how your position is changing at that exact moment that you look at your speedometer. So how do we take our average rate of change and turn it into an instantaneous rate of change? Yep, apply a limit. So we're looking right here. What variable do I send to what value? Yep, h to 0. So we're just going to take the amount of time that elapsed between our first and second readings and make that super small. So that amount of time between is h. So this is lim h approaches 0. Now if you have a high speed camera that takes lots of frames per second, you could pretty accurately get your estimate your instantaneous rate of change by looking at the difference between two frames and how far something moved. And maybe that's like a, I don't know, a hundredth of a second and you could get a pretty accurate measurement of the speed right there. So you, there's plenty of devices that can take a measurement with a super tiny h. So, you know, whatever, a hundredth of a second, thousandths of a second maybe. But in calculus, we'll actually find the exact uh, rate of change at that moment. And of course, this is also known as what? This is the definition of something. The derivative of what function? Tangent. Which one? Tangent. 
We, so we could use it to find the slope of the tangent. Yeah. So what function is not the function f? What's the name of this function? T. T is the input. Oh. So the function's a. s. So this will be s prime of t. So our function's s, and the derivative is the prime. The input's t. The other way to write it is d dt of s. So when we write s prime, in this case, we're talking about the t derivative, not the x derivative. So two ways to write our derivative here. This is called the velocity. That tells you how your position is changing. That's what we call velocity. And a lot of times you're going to see this written as the v of t function for obviously velocity of t equals the derivative of the position. So that's how velocity and position are related. So your velocity is the derivative of your position function. Next up, speed. So this is our velocity. Speed. Speed is very closely related to velocity. Now it's tempting to use the S of t for speed, but obviously we've already occupied the letter S. So that's not going to, we can't reuse it. So speed is the absolute value of your velocity. So you would never say, even if you're backing up in your car, your speedometer still says 3. It doesn't say negative 3 miles per hour. So hopefully you're looking behind you, but maybe your passenger can look at your speedometer. Um, I don't know if every car tells you your speed when you're reversing, but a lot of them do. And it will be your positive speed, not your negative speed. So speed is technically always, well, you could be 0, but it's never going to be negative. And if we were using vectors, speed would be the magnitude of a vector. So the definition doesn't change for speed. So that's the difference between velocity and speed. Speed is a uh, measurement of how much velocity you have, the magnitude or the absolute value. So they're very closely related. Uh, there's plenty of people that misuse words. I know uh, I used to do paintball a lot, and they would call they would say the muscle vo muzzle velocity, and then say it was 300 feet per second. That doesn't depend on what direction you're aiming. So they were actually talking about the speed, even though they used the word velocity. So you have to watch out. There's a lot of words that are very misused. So velocity and speed are two commonly uh, misused. Oh, well, we're talking about words that are misused, debt and deficit. Those are another two good words that are misused. Uh, oh man, I just forgot which one is which. The total amount you owe is the deficit? No. That yeah, doesn't matter. Who cares? One of them is how much it changes per year, and the other one is uh, the total amount that you owe. So. Deficit's the yearly. So yeah, the deficit is how much you have to pay every year, and then the total amount you owe is your whatever the other one is, debt. There we go. Man, that went well. <laughs> all right, acceleration. So how does acceleration relate to all this? So if you have a vehicle that has a large amount of acceleration, what that really means is you can change your velocity or your speed very quickly. So acceleration is the change in your velocity. So if you have a motorcycle or some other cool vehicle that's not a Prius, uh, you probably have a lot of acceleration. So you can change your velocity quite a bit. So that'll be the next topic, acceleration. And of course, we'll use A of t for that, acceleration. This is the change in velocity. So this is the derivative of the velocity. Now we said the 
velocity is a derivative of your position. So I can write it as d dt of the velocity. And using this up here, I'm going to replace v of t by s prime of t. And of course, this is the derivative of the derivative of s. So we can write it as s double prime of t. So acceleration is the change in the change in position, or the change in velocity, however you want to think about it. So that's your acceleration and how it relates to position. And last up, anybody know what the change in acceleration is called? No, that would just be negative acceleration. <laughs> Jerk. Oh. You've probably s been in a car with somebody who drives in a jerky manner. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that they have a nice car. <laughs> so you can have a very large amount of acceleration, but still drive very smoothly. In fact, if you're driving a motorcycle in the rain, you have a large, of large amount of acceleration, but you can't use it because you'll slide out. So there are plenty of times, or if you, there's an ice storm, you can have a powerful car that has a lot of acceleration, but if you actually use it uh, or change your acceleration, you will slide out. So jerk, of course, will go J of T. So jerk is a change in acceleration. And that is the double derivative of your velocity or the triple derivative of your position. And if you think about driving and jerk, if somebody is driving, they have a lot of jerk, what that means is their acceleration is changing quite a bit. So they're pushing the gas down really hard, hitting the brake, putting the gas, hitting the brake, gas brake, gas brake, like that. So their acceleration is going positive, negative, positive, negative. So you've probably been, and it, most new drivers do things like that, or they hit the gas and the brake at the same time. They drive with two feet like Fred Flintstone. Uh, so hopefully jerk is something that you don't experience much anymore as you make smart decisions and you become a better driver. You reduce the amount of jerk. You still have fun and accelerate, but you do so without a huge amount of jerk. What's that? In less rain. Okay. Well, hopefully you are even more careful in the rain. <laughs> what happens if you hit your brakes really hard in the rain and you apply a huge negative acceleration? You yeah, you can slip out and total your car. So <laughs> you really want to minimize the jerk at all times. So when you hit the brakes, you don't want to slam the brakes on. You want to, hopefully you looked ahead and you're applying the brakes early. So that is all for well, five if you count speed, uh, but speed is really just the uh, magnitude or velocity, uh, the absolute value of velocity. What's that? So there's five for uh, position, I didn't, I didn't underline it or displacement. There we go. That's the last one. Yeah. I don't really count speed because that's just the absolute value of velocity. It's not terribly exciting. So there's really four. So let's look at a velocity graph. So when I graph, I'm going to graph v of t, which is s prime of t. So the graph we're going to look at is not the position graph, it's the velocity graph, the derivative of the position graph. We're going to go over eight total, and I'll count by twos.
So we're going to take this graph right here, and this is, of course, V of T, and we're going to answer some questions. So this will describe how a particle is moving. And let's start with moving forward. So before we describe the t-values, what does it mean to move forward with the velocity? You know about the velocity. So what does it mean to move forward when it comes to velocity? So don't say things about the acceleration or the position. Only the velocity. Speed. So let's think about velocity. Speed won't tell you moving forward or backwards. So speed will be completely unhelpful here. So when what is positive? So when our velocity is positive, we're moving forward. So that's what happens when you move forward. If you talk about change of position, it means your position is increasing. But what that means is your velocity is positive. So I've read inequality, it means when v of t is greater than 0, you are moving forward. So on this graph, when is the velocity not equal to 0, but greater than 0? There's two places. So it's happening when t equals 1 and when t equals 2, but there's a lot more than just those two t values. Eight, 7. What about between 1 and 2? Is velocity greater than 0 up here? Yeah. Yep, it's greater than 0, not just there, over there, and it's also over there. What you don't want to look at is the slope of this graph. It doesn't matter. When is it above zero? So your velocity is positive all through this region, which is zero to three. Now, is it okay to include the endpoints, or should I go and not include the endpoints? Not include because at the endpoints we're actually zero. We're not moving. So at time zero we're not moving, and at time three we're not moving either. Now it's tempting to say in this part we are not going forward, but what's actually happening there? You're looking at the velocity. You're slowing down. So you're getting to a stop sign, something like that. You're still moving, and you actually stop at 3 for exactly one moment, and then you go backwards. So you're basically slowing down, maybe going to a parking spot, and at that point, you're going backwards. So that's what's happening here. You're slowing down. You're not going backwards. You're going backwards uh, after 3, but not before. Now, is that the only place we're moving forward? Where's the other? 7 and 8. So go union. 7, we're not moving. What about 8? So 8 I get to include, because at 8, we're whatever that is, half. So I get to include 8, because it is definitely not 0 there. Now I don't know what happens after this graph. Maybe it keeps speeding up. Maybe it goes constant. Maybe it slows down. But that doesn't affect what's happening at 8 seconds. So this is all we know about, so I'm not going to make any claims about what's happening after 8 seconds. So that's moving forward. Next one, moving backwards. So of course, that's the opposite condition of moving forwards. Well, almost the opposite. The actual opposite would be less than or equal to. But we don't want to allow equal. 
So write down the interval or intervals that we're going to move backwards. So that means our graph is less than 0. So backwards we have 3 to 5, but don't include 3, don't include 5, because you're not moving. Next, velocity. Well, let's go with not moving now. So not moving, which is not forward, not backwards, stationary. What does that mean about your velocity? So it is 0, so equals 0. So it's basically when the first two are not happening. So definitely between 5 and 7, we're not moving. Do you want to be careful, though? What about between 1 and 2? Something's not happening. So we're moving forward, but we're constant velocity moving forward. So cruise control's on, something like that. We're still moving, but our velocity's not changing. So 5 and 7. Do I get to include the endpoints? Is the velocity equal to 0 at 5 and at 7? Yep. Is that the only place that we have an x-intercept? Yes, we do. So that is when our velocity is 0. So also at 0 and at 3 are two other points that. Yeah, so those are single values. Uh, so the way we write single values is you put them with 0 and 3. This is how you contain single values right here. So you're just listing out elements. And that's set builder notation right there where you're just explicitly listing off every single, there's only two elements, so we just write them both down. But of course, if I use any of the other brackets, I would not mean, if I use parentheses, that would be an open interval. If I use square brackets, that would be a closed interval, every number in between. So the curly brackets are used for when you're writing out a set of these actual values. So next up, velocity increasing, also known as accelerating. And I'm going to write accelerating forwards. So velocity increasing. Good news is we have a velocity graph. What property of the graph means that our velocity is increasing? It's not the same as moving forward. So it's not going to be when v of t is greater than 0. What property of this graph do I need to look at to know when the velocity is increasing? Positive slope. So it's all about slope of the graph. So when is a graph going up? That means when is a graph increasing? That means our velocity is increasing. So I want to know when is the slope greater than 0. So I could write that as v prime t greater than 0. So not v of t, but the derivative of t. Or the derivative of v is greater than 0. So where's the first place the slope is positive? 0 to 1. And we're not going to include 0, not going to, well, there is no slope at 1 because the slope doesn't match on both sides. So one side is 0, the other side is positive. So there's actually no slope at 1, but all the way between 0 and 1. Where's the next place it's increasing? 4 to 5, but it looks negative. 
So it looks negative because you're not looking at the slope. What is negative about that point that I wrote down? Here's the slope. The slope's very positive. It's very steep. It's not the slope that's negative. The direction is negative. So we're going backwards, but we are accelerating in a forwards direction. So we're going backwards more slowly. So you think about it as you're backing out of a parking spot right here, and then you are slowing down going backwards, and you're, well, you come to a complete stop right here. But at some point when you back out of a parking spot, you're going to slow down, which actually is accelerating in the forwards direction. Now, if you just kept going backwards and accelerating, you would be going backwards forever. So at some point, you probably want to stop going backwards, hit the brakes, have the velocity of zero, and then go forwards, unless you're in a weird mood. But generally, you're going to stop backing up and go forwards at some point. So that is four to five that we're going to be uh, velocity increasing. Is that the only, and you, oh, four and five. Yeah, so we have a zero slope here, and at five we have another zero slope. So you don't want to include those two points, because we have a zero slope right there. Is that the only place that we're, the only two places we're um, increasing our velocity? Seven and eight, same thing going on. I could do velocity decreasing. Let's just save a little time. Where is velocity decreasing? Between three and four. Is that the only place? Two and three. Two and three. What about the number three? At three. I didn't really draw the, I drew a sort of ambiguous graph. You can see there's a slight problem in there. It's not even continuous technically. So let's try to fix this and smooth it out. Didn't really pay too much attention. I didn't think it would be a big deal. Let's pretend that this is actually a smooth curve. Delete that point, there we go. So I tried to make it so that there was a zero slope right here. So in the middle, of this, you're actually going to not be decreasing right there. So to be a little careful on the moving backwards, we're not going to be moving backwards uh, or, or decreasing our velocity at three because we have a zero slope. So, well, might as well write that two to three, three to four. So a little bit careful, we're not actually decreasing at three. And last up, maximum speed. Now I use the word speed, not velocity. Maximum speed. Is it between one and two? Is it in this? Or is there somewhere else we have a larger speed? So what about four? What about down here? Somebody's reversing really quickly. So we're going backwards twice as much, with twice as much speed as we ever went forwards in this position graph here, or in this uh, velocity graph. So we're actually achieving the maximum speed at four seconds. And our actual speed is two at that point. 
The velocity is negative 2, but the speed is the absolute value of that. So I want to warn you about a homework problem in this section. I think there's actually two homework problems that they give you the graph of a derivative of a function they're going to ask you about. And you have to make sure you read about what the actual graph is. So they'll graph the derivative of f. And a lot of students assume it's a graph of f. And answer questions without reading what is they are actually graphing. So yeah, I think it's this section. There may be one other section. But make sure you read carefully what the graph, if the graph's a f, graph of f or the graph derivative of f, and then what they're asking you questions about. So there'll be a couple questions that a lot of students think are broken because they get every single part wrong. But it's because they're not reading this is a graph of the derivative of f. So be a little careful when you're answering questions. If you get every single part wrong and it's not making sense, make sure you're actually reading the question carefully. You might be answering questions about basically some other graph, not the one that they're giving you. So I don't think there are any questions broken in this section, but if one feels broken, you're probably not reading the question correctly. And it's just a little tiny label underneath the graph. This is the graph of f prime of x instead of this is a graph of f of x. So the free fall equation is s of t equals negative 4.9 t squared. And I think this is in, it's definitely per second. This might be either feet per second or meters per second. Any physics people here? I think it's in meters per second. Or this is how many meters total? After t seconds. So if you drop something after zero seconds, it hasn't moved. But after one second, it will have moved 4.9 meters downwards. And this assumes no air resistance. So obviously, you drop something from high enough up, and the air resistance will become significant and slow it down. And that's what they call terminal velocity. And we're going to answer some questions here. How many meters does a rock fall in the first two seconds? Of course, the first two seconds means the interval between zero seconds and two seconds. So answer that question. How far does a rock fall in two, the first two seconds? So this is delta s, which is s of 2 minus s of 0. So just figure out the difference. on that. Now just to warn you, I really suck at multiplication, so the way I did this that's how I did the multiplication. Multiplied 5 by 4 and then subtracted 0 0.1 times 4. All right, so that's how far it fell in the first two seconds, almost 20. So the second two seconds, and what I mean is from 2 to 4. So the next, set, the next 
two second interval after that interval. How far did it fall? You might need a calculator for this. Although you might be able to do it without a calculator. Let's see what your arithmetic skills are made of. Fifty eight point eight. Is that right? All right. Everybody's lucky once in a while. I just got lucky there. Good. I'm not very good at arithmetic. <laughs> All right. So it fell quite a bit more, triple on about triple the amount in the second two seconds compared to the first two seconds. So that means it's going a lot faster, and that should make some, a lot of sense. When you first drop something, it doesn't go too quickly, and the longer it's falling for, it starts to go quite a bit faster. So let's look at some velocities, speed, and acceleration. And we'll look at the value uh, time one and time three. So right in the middle of those two intervals. So find velocity and acceleration. So how do we find the velocity from the information that we started with somewhere up here? Oh, so this is meters out of t seconds. This is a displacement. I didn't write that anywhere, but the units are measured in meters. So that can't be a meters per second measurement. So it's a meters, so that's going to measure a distance or a displacement. So just from the units, you can tell that this is a displacement function. So how do we take a displacement function and get velocity? So the answer to probably 90% of the questions I'm going to ask you for the rest of the quarter is going to be the derivative. So you can say that to almost every question I ask you and be right 90% of the time. So how do I take the displacement and get the velocity? The derivative. That would have been mean if it wasn't, if it was a 10% that wasn't. So somewhere up here. If we look back, here we go. This is velocity related to position. So we're going to take the derivative of the velocity and we'll get our, the derivative of the position and we'll get our velocity. And then when we need acceleration, we'll take the derivative of the derivative and that will be our acceleration. So the answer to that question is take the derivative again. So V of T is s prime of t and we're going to need acceleration so that'll be s double derivative of t what rule do you need to take this derivative so there's constant multiple rule So 
So a constant multiple rule. You could bring that negative 4.9 in front. What's the derivative of t squared? 2t. So this is the uh, just a power rule right here. So nothing fancy going on. So that is negative uh, 9.8 t So any calculus questions, you just multiply your uh, 4.9 by 2, and that's 9.8. Next up, we're going to take the derivative of the derivative we just took. So if you write this out all the way, this is ddt ddt negative 4.9t squared. We already took the first derivative. What is the derivative of negative 9.8t? Using too many brain cells. Negative 9.8. So our t is already at the first power, so you drop 1 off the power, and you have t to the 0 power, or just 1. So this is negative 9.8 should be a familiar number if you've taken a science class. Well, maybe they don't talk about that. Is it the gravity That's the gravity. That's how much gravity is accelerating you downwards. And that better not change. Well, it'll change if you go really far away, like if we're going towards Mars. At some point, you will be far enough away from Earth, you won't feel that. The gravity from Earth will, change, will feel less. Uh, but negative 9.8 is the constant acceleration of gravity right there. So let's go ahead and answer these questions. All you have to do, we have all the calculus computed. You just have to plug in what is S prime of 1 and S double prime of 1. That'll tell you the velocity and acceleration at time 1 and do the same thing at time 3. It's not very exciting to plug into the uh, acceleration function. I'm just negative 9.8, but the other function you'll get different values out of. So the acceleration is constant, so that's a little bit boring. Yeah, so it's 4.9 4 times double or times 2, yeah. And the reason we have the negative is just, you could do this with positive, but that just uh, to signify that it's going in a downwards direction. Uh, you could count all that as positive if you wanted to and just somewhere right, you know, whatever, 58.8 feet downwards instead of negative 58.8 feet. No, I'm, so I'm, these values right here, I'm subbing in a 3 for those t values. So, negative 9.8 times 3. So the velocity at any time t is this first line that's on the board. The acceleration at any time t is the second line on the board. And all I'm doing is taking three and dropping it in for wherever I see a t. This tells me velocity at any time and I just want to know at three seconds. So I just put three where I see t. The second one I said was kind of boring because there's it's constant. So no matter what time I considered it would always be negative 9.8. So gravity's always pulling down at the same rate uh, until you start to go far enough off the surface of the earth that it, it would decrease. But that's more of a physics topic for a physics class. 
So we're going a lot faster at three seconds than we are going at one second, which should make a lot of sense because you traveled a lot further in the second interval than you went in the first interval. So you should be going faster during that interval than you went in the first one. So we'll do a few more word problems, and then we'll get into some trade derivatives. <coughs> 